En dan is de next one, uh, Tom uh, Sevjur. So he will talk about biofilms and he is from here, from Celsi uh, Institute, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Pseudomonas, the Pseudomonads are model biofilm producers. Um, and, uh, but they're more than just model bio, biofilm producers, they're quite important. They appear in a wide range of clinical and environmental settings. Um, they're also thought to contribute to, to more than one in five um, clinical uh, or critical infections, um, such as in wounds or nos nosocomial hospital related infections. Um, and they're very problematic, they're very difficult to treat once they're established. Uh, they have a high degree of antibiotic resistance and uh, this recalcitrance is um, due in large part to their uh, propensity to form biofilms. Um, and when they form, uh, contribute to infections, they look something like this. They're characterised by this sort of slimy, sort of pretty funky appearance. Um, and they have this, this uh, greenish tint due to the, some of the, the mediators and, and iron collators that they express. Um, and if we think about uh, biofilms more broadly, uh, this, this property of, of uh, stress tolerance or antibiotic resistance isn't, isn't confined to the pseudomonads. It's, it's uh, experienced... Um, uh, by, uh, by biofilms more generally. Um, and it's not the only property that characterises biofilms or distinguishes biofilms from organisms that are free swimming. Um, biofilms also have a... They, they experience mass transfer limitations, so this allows for gradients to establish, which uh, sets up interesting biodiversity. Um, there's an increased surface area for resource capture and retention. You get some quite interesting social interactions um, between organisms and biofilms. This is in community biofilms. Um, and they're known to be uh, more virulent than, than free-swimming microorganisms. Um, so all these properties that differentiate biofilms from free-swimming microorganisms are known as emergent uh, biofilm properties. Um, and they're not due to the cells themselves so much as the, the, the matrix that the biofilm or that the cells within the matrix produce. Um, so we want to understand what this matrix is, you know, what the, 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 the important players in the matrix is and how they're actually contributing to these functions. Um, but unfortunately we're, we're in the dark age a little bit in, in uh, biofilm research. Um, if we, you know, go as recent as 2010 in a, in a review paper, the matrix was described in, in terms like this, where we have sort of an indiscriminate polysaccharide, we have some proteins, we have some, uh, from some, some DNA, all um, interacting in a fairly um, indiscriminate manner. We have uh, indiscriminate physical interactions of hydrogen bonding, ionic interactions. And as we know from, uh, from the material that's been presented today, um, which is of course of a very high quality, um, this uh, description sort of doesn't really do the complexity uh, and the beauty of these systems justice. Um, and the reason that we have such a, a, a rudimentary fundamental understanding of the matrix is in large part because these are very complex systems. So if we look at one of the pseudomonads, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it's a, 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 a typical model biofilm system. And for Pseudomonas alone, no fewer than eight, I think there are probably nine or ten in fact, exopolymers have, have been identified as playing very important roles in their function. Um, there are the three polysaccharides. A lot of the focus has been on these three polysaccharides, which incidentally have, have not actually been isolated in their functional form. Um, there's uh, nucleic acids. DNA has been identified as, as playing an important role, um, although that role is not clear. And uh, there are proteins that have also been identified as playing an important role in Pseudomonas biofilms. Um, but we contend that in, in order to really get to the bottom of what's doing what in these biofilms, we need to start from, from the basics. And the most basic requirement for biofilm formation is that the exopolymers participate in some degree of cross-linking. So we set out to identify what the most fundamental cross-linked subunit of these Pseudomonas biofilms is. Um, which we described as the, the foundation structure, the foundation polymer, to borrow, borrow a term from, from ecologists that they use to describe the importance of certain trees in supporting uh, biodiversity in forests. We see evidence, we saw evidence of this cross-linking um, when we did some uh, active tweezing experiments. We grew up the biofilms. Oh, this is not going to work, but I'll describe it to you. We, described, we grew up the biofilms um, with, with mag magnetic beads. We applied a magnetic force and we saw that there was this 
reversible deformation over, over quite great distances, 100, 200 microns. Um, and we saw this throughout the, the network, uh, throughout the biofilm. So we have a high integrity network throughout these, um, these biofilms. And we see the, the, this is the reversible def deformation described here. Um, and of course, we want to know what it is that is allowing for this interesting rheological property. And that is effectively supporting a lot of the emergent biofilm properties that I discussed uh, earlier. But in order to do that, the starting point really needs to be to isolate or to, to develop the means to isolate, extract and reconstitute the, uh, the, the, the sub, you know, this basic sub uh, cross-linking subunit. Um, so, all right, so we want to isolate um, and reconstitute the most fundamental uh, cross-linking sub subunit. So, to do this we need to isolate, we need to extract and isolate the uh, functional constituent, this cross-linking sub substituent. Um, and um, to do that we need to solubilize, be able to solubilize the biofilm. And, and this is actually quite difficult because they're notoriously recalcitrant. Um, they're almost by definition poorly soluble in aqueous solvents, so we screened dozens of uh, solvents, we looked at organic solvents, but eventually we, we found that uh, these ionic liquids were particularly effective at solubilizing <coughs> the biofilm. And what we also observed, that in the process of solubilizing these biofilms, um, the ionic liquid became very sticky. So we, we, we concluded then that the, the networking constituent was being transferred into the, uh, into the solution, and we could actually measure this, um, the, the, the extent of networking by means of normal force under high speed, high shear rheology. Um, and, and by doing that, we, we determined a power law relationship between uh, normal force and shear rate of about 1.3, indicating that, that the, uh, the cross-linking constituent was a semi-flexible molecule. Um, but we could also use this to identify the contribution of the individual exopolymers to this effect. Um, so we, we looked at uh, using genetic knockdown mutants for the various putative polysaccharides. We knocked out protein, RNA and DNA by selective enzyma enzymatic hydrolysis. And we found that, um, that they all contributed um, to, as we can see, by the difference in the uh, relaxation time. There was definitely an effect of knocking these things out. But the only treatment that actually reduced the normal force or that removed this networking effect completely was DNA or extracellular DNA. From, and from that we could conclude therefore that extracellular DNA was this uh, foundation um, uh, polymer. And then of course we stained our biofilms and, and we confirmed this observation because we saw um, that there was uh, uptake of the DNA stain and we saw these DNA fibres throughout the biofilm. Now this is not completely new. Um, eDNA was first identified in biofilms about 15 years ago, although its exact precise role was not, has not been satisfactorily uh, explained. Um, and then when people have tried to explain why eDNA is, is behaving so differently to chromosomal DNA by, by, by looking at the, the sequence, um, there, there was no obvious difference between chromosomal and extracellular DNA. So, so having identified DNA or extracellular DNA as a, a foundation polymer, we wanted to understand um, what happens as DNA passages from the nucleoid of cells into the extracellular matrix. Why it presents so differently extracellularly to how it presents intracellularly. So first step was to recover the extracellular DNA from the ionic liquid. Uh, which we did using fractional precipitation and chromatography. And then we observed when we had uh, isolated it, when we transferred it back into water from the ionic liquid, it uh, self-assembled. We had associative phase separation, as uh, Bjorn uh, discussed earlier, and it uh, formed a, a translucent gel similar to the biofilm from which it was extracted. Uh, we didn't see any markers for cell lysis, so we were pretty confident that what we were looking at was, was extracellular DNA rather than something from within the cells. Um, and it, we, we saw that it behaves very similar, similarly to, to the biofilms from what it was extracted, from, from which it was extracted in that. It uh, had a, a characteristic high pH uh, uh, gel to sol transition. And when we did uh, circular dichroism with, under conditions of heating, um, both the, the, the biofilm and the isolate had this um, DNA CD peak at about 270 nanometers. Of course, it was more pronounced in the isolated material. And if we looked at the intensity of that peak with heating for both the biofilm 
and the isolated material, we saw a very, very similar trend. So the extracellular DNA did appear to be from the extracellular matrix of cells and it did appear to be behaving the same way in isolation as it did in the biofilm. So that uh, indicated that we weren't corrupting it during isolation. Oops. Um, so then we wanted to understand more about this extracellular DNA. Uh, we looked at um, HSQC NMR um, and we saw that with the isolate there are in fact two families of uh, molecules. We saw these broad peaks which is, uh, um, indicates that they're high molecular weight peaks. We also saw that there are these sharp, we actually had eight um, family, eight uh, group of uh, these sharp or small molecule HSQC peaks. Um, we looked at the toxic correlations for both uh, set of molecules and we saw um, toxic correlations for the uh, H1 prime of the, the broad molecules to a deoxygenated um, C2 prime indicating that the high molecular weight material was DNA but for the low molecular weight material we saw that there was no such um, toxic correlation. So the low molecular weight material, this, this, uh, these sharp peaks, were actually ribo, were, were, were RNA or ribonucleotides. So it appeared that um, we had both eDNA and extracellular RNA present in our isolated material that appeared to be contributing to this um, gelation effect, this associative phase separation. We looked at the uh, 31 phosphorus uh, NMR spectrum for, of, of the isolate and we identified that there were actually um, monoesterified and diasterified peaks. So the diasterified is uh, consistent with DNA. Um, this RNA, this um, monoesterified indicates that we'd have mono um, ribonucleotides. Um, and then we correlated by uh, means of, uh, of, of long range uh, um, correlation spectroscopy the phosphorus peaks with um, the proton peaks from the, uh, from the proton NMR. And we saw that these eight uh, phosphorus peaks could be attributed to four two prime monoribonucleotides and four three prime monoribonucleotides. Interestingly, we were then also able to quantify the uh, monoribonucleotides and we found that they were purine rich. They were 57% ANP and plus uh, GNP. We also saw that there was a, a, a discordance between the GC content of the RNA and the, what we know to be the GC content of the genome of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So from this we can, uh, this perhaps suggests that, that um, the nature of the interaction between the DNA and the RNA is non-canonical or non-Watson-Crick. But we didn't know whether the uh, ribonucleotides were existing in the biofilm and in the matrix as, as, as RNA or as a monoribonucleotide. So we looked at solid state NMR um, for, for, for the uh, occurrence of these um, mono and diasterified peaks. And we saw that the monoesterified peaks only occurred, only appeared um, at the final stage of preparation, which was when we put the uh, solubilized the RNA or the, the extracellular nucleic acid isolate in um, in alkali solution. We we confirmed this with the with the the, the standard, and we also um, submitted the standard to the same isolation protocol that we had subjected the biofilm to. Um, so this indicated to us that actually what we have is extracellular RNA, not monoribonucleotides in the, in the biofilm and in the, uh, in the gel. And it also tells us that the tried and true method of um, ice or solubilizing biofilms by means of um, alkali treatment probably or may in fact be effective because it transterifies RNA. We then stained uh, the isolate uh, for, um, with uh, RNA select dye. Um, which of course is specific for RNA and we did observe the same uh, fibre-like structures in the isolated material um, staining positive for RNA that we saw staining positive for DNA in the biofilm. And then we looked, so we, we, we still at this stage don't understand the nature of the interaction between the DNA and the RNA so we did solid state um, NMR uh, 15N um, proton um, long range uh, through space correlation spectroscopy um, and, and this confirmed our uh, belief that um, it was free of protein. We didn't, certainly didn't see any uh, protein um, peaks, um, but we did see a lot of nucleic acid peaks. Um, and we saw in the amino region of uh, nucleic acids, we saw four um, peaks. 
um, that these two here are amino, amino protons um, that are correlating with tertiary nitrogens in uh, canonical Watson Crick base pairing. And these two here are for thymine and uridine and guanine amino protons uh, correlating with a carbonyl oxygen, um, which would indicate that we have non canonical uh, base pairing or non Watson Crick base pairing. We also saw um, an indirect uh, correlation between these two amino protons and a tertiary nitrogen of, um, for, for the guanine peak, we saw that for, for, for cytidine and, and for the uh, um, thiamine and uridine peaks, we saw it for adenosine. So, so we have Watson-Crick and non-Watson-Crick base pairing um, occurring in our uh, isolated material. So, so one of the possibilities for the non-Watson-Crick base pairing, I mean, it, it indicates we have GG or G. T or U or TT or, or UU, um, tetrads or base pairs. So there's a possibility that we have, may have uh, G quadruplexing. And so um, G quadruplex, I think uh, Antoine will talk about this more tomorrow, but G quadruplex form when uh, we have, uh, when guanine bases you know, stack, um, uh, associate by means of Hoogstein base pairing, um, they, 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 they stack around, uh, they're, they're stabilized by a monovalent cation. And the stability of the tetrad, uh, the quadruplex is dependent on the nature of this monovalent cation and potassium is known to stabilise the quadruplexes to a greater extent than other monovalent cations. And we certainly saw that there was a, a strong biofilm dependent um, growth, uh, uh, biofilm dependent um, growth on uh, media um, depending on potassium concentration rather than sodium and lithium. So there's a high potassium dependence. Um, that we didn't observe in the free uh, swimming microorganisms. So, so it appears that extracellular DNA coexists with RNA um, and they contribute to form this foundation biofilm matrix structure. We know that the RNA is protein is, is purine rich um, and we see evidence of Watson Crick and non canonical base pairings. Um, and these non canonical base pairings could include um, GG, GT, or U, or T, U, T, U base pairs or tetrads. Um, and we also observed that the biofilm formation was potassium dependent, which could allude to a contribution um, from G quadruplexing. The question is, are we getting an extracellular RNA DNA duplex? Um, certainly the high, R high purine content and the high thermodynamic stability that we observed would be due, would be consistent with an RNA DNA duplex where RNA, RNA purines are known to bind to their DNA pyrimidine complement, complement with a far higher affinity than, than the other way around. Um, and RNA is known to have this uh, greater tendency for hairpinning and non-canonical base pairing than, than DNA. And this could allow for these multivalent interactions and, and, ne and networking. And we also observed that the RNA was small, so perhaps the RNA is, is non-coding. Um, so this perhaps alludes to another biological function for RNA DNA hybrids. It's already been shown that they um, can contribute to uh, activating the host inflammasome during infection, but perhaps this alludes to a mechanism by which they can do this. Um, it also tells us that the information for eDNA gelation may in fact be um, encoded for in the small RNA that, um, that uh, precipitates this associative phase, phase separation rather than in the DNA itself. This is actually the first study that alludes to a role for RNA in extracellular matrix uh, building um, and potentially uh, additionally it provides an explanation for the role of extracellular DNA in these biofilms. <coughs> it's also a departure from the prevailing sentiment that matrices are random masses of physical interactions where only the polysaccharides can gel and we hope that, uh, that, that it's another step uh, forward towards uh, you know, generating more of a polyelectrolyte understanding of biofilm matrices. Um, so this is a, a collaborative effort involving uh, numerous partners around Singapore, at Celsius, of course, um, where our focus is on, is on biofilms. Um, also uh, very valuable contributions from SPMS, uh, University of Queensland in Australia, of course, SMART, they helped a lot with the biophysical characterization, none of, of which only a sample was presented here, um, as well as NUS. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, I'd welcome any questions. Okay, thank you, Tom. Any questions? Ah. Oh, 
very, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm not so, so familiar with um, the biofilm. It is, of course, a very, very important biological object. Uh, from your talk, uh, I may decide uh, that DNA and RNA, uh, they are structural component of biofilm. What's, what's the uh, composition? What's the content of DNA, RNA, polysaccharides and proteins to, to decide? Because I'm not sure that they um, play a structural um, function in biofilm. So um, I, I hope that I've demonstrated that the uh, extracellular DNA plays a very important um, uh, function in the biofilms. It forms these uh, networks and forms gels. Um, in, uh, the thing about biofilms is they're very diverse. Um, the, uh, every, not every, but uh, biofilms tend to, to express themselves very differently extracellularly. So in this particular biofilm we see that extracellular DNA can form these gels. Um, it remains to be demonstrated that extracellular DNA can do this in other biofilms. Um, but uh, if we look at the uh, C... Uh, uh, the content of them in a biofilm. In terms of mass? Uh, yeah. uh, probably about... Percentage. Uh, probably, <laughs> about 20, uh, probably about 10 percent. So if we look at the CD spectrum, we see that this is the biofilm spectrum here. This is the DNA component. Um, and, and we think that this is probably protein. So protein is a significant component of, um, of, uh, of, of these biofilms, pseudomonas biofilms. But proteins could not uh, replicate the behaviour of eDNA in terms of um, stimulating this uh, gel, gelation and networking. So, so even though proteins are the major component in terms of uh, materially, um, functionally and structurally we believe that eDNA is actually um, more important in terms of generating this foundation structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so okay. Some doubts. <laughs> in your last slide, you have yep. a model for the network. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, uh, this is still... So, yeah, uh, which, uh, where the network is built up of this um, hi uh, yeah, the, uh, RNA DNA hybrid and, and, and this um, quadruplex and so on. So. Yeah, but I guess it's it's just a model, a working it's model. It's just a model uh, at the moment. I mean, how, how do you? Uh, what is your plan to try to validate the model? Well, the first thing, of course, is that we're trying to sequence um, the RNA, the small RNA. Um, so actually, there's a paper that showed that RNA can can gel, can form gels, and it does that um, by means of hairpinning and, and, and quadruplexing. So you can get these multivalent structures taking place, um, and uh, so RNA, there's such a thing as... Yeah, but could you try to reproduce this well, the idea in vitro by, uh, as a self-assembly system? Exactly. So the ultimate goal is to find out what the small RNA, what the sequence of the small RNA is, and to, to determine whether there is a characteristic um, sequence that could um, seed, seed uh, this gelation. And then we could express it, of course, and add it to, to, to DNA and see whether we get some. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. But I mean, we're only at a stage now where we, we know that RNA is there. We're sequencing it, so we'll need to you know understand the sequencing, the, the, the sequences, and then we can start thinking about um, doing exactly what you suggest. So I have a question. Where does this come from? Is this DNA and RNA, is that secreted by the cells or does it come from disease cells? Oh, so this is all from, um, this is uh, not in a, in a model, this is just in a, in a laboratory where we grew it up in... Uh, no, no, I understand, yeah. but in the, in the biofilm, in the, the biofilm. matrix. So, so the, uh, the extracellular DNA comes from the cells themselves. Yeah, but is it secreted or does it result from that the cells die? Yeah, well, that's right. So this is this is not uh, this is not known. Um, there, we, we, we're we're trying to screen various mutants for for um, transporters, extracellular DNA transporters, um, but we haven't found uh, a protein that contributes to this at the moment. Um, there is a there is a theory that you have explosive cell lysis, and this results in the the, the mass release of DNA into the matrix. Um, but and, uh, and can you quantify the ratio between RNA and D DNA? Yeah, we, um, we, no, at this stage we haven't done that, um, but uh, we, I mean, we quantified the RNA by looking at the 31 phosphorus NMR spectrum, um, and so we could potentially do something similar. I mean, it's very difficult to um, quantify. I, I am asking because if you, you know, if you take different samples, do you get this about the same ratio? Or okay, is it just so a random type of... Uh, yeah, so if we take the same biofilm yeah. um, and we do the same analysis, we get the same ratio. Okay. 
Oh, there's still more questions. <laughs> Well, this is an indirect question to, to, to your talk. Um, yeah. When I see the Petri dish with the biofilm inside, uh, I'm wondering uh, if, if, if somebody can um, engineer the substrate itself to avoid the formation of the biofilm. Yeah, well, this is the ultimate goal, of course, in, in terms of understanding what is the composition of biofilms. Um, we want to be able to ultimately um, control them, so, so prevent them from form, forming. And there, you know, I've, I've, just, I've talked about biofilms as being, um, you know, contributing to, to infections, whatever, which are all negative things, but there are a lot of positive things about bi biofilms as well. You know, a lot of wastewater and uh, environmental rehabilitation processes rely on uh, biofilms. So, so we really need to work towards developing a broader um, uh, suite of, of uh, approaches to controlling biofilm formation. So, so um, and, and the first step really is, uh, is understanding what is in the matrix. But we've looked at various things, um, quorum sensing, uh, disrupting molecules to, to, to interfere with the communication between bacteria, um, using different uh, ionic, uh, you know, ions, cations to, to try and destabilize. And there, for example, here we saw that uh, potassium promotes um, biofilm formation in this particular incidence, incidence, incidence whereas um, Lithium, for example, didn't promote it. So th there's one simple strategy that we could perhaps explore. Um, but yeah, this is really the starting point. Just a quick question. Yep. Uh, do you believe that it's scanner or is it... Uh, Thank you. Have you studied any other uh, pseudomonas? Yeah, so this is something that we observe for all the pseudomonads. Um, and I looked at Mycobacterium, Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus, and Staphylococcus epidermidis. Um, these are all known to produce extracellular DNA. Um, and I didn't see the same behavior that we saw here, but that was only, you know, single strains under a single growth condition. So it is still possible that these um, organisms express it, but we, you know, in the, in the model systems that we look at, we weren't able to get the, the, the strains to produce extracellular DNA. doesn't matter. Right? Uh, the, um, um, the ribose sugar of RNA is much more vulnerable to hydrolysis than the deoxyribose sugar. Yep. So the way you've drawn the structure of the crosslinks, are you envisaging a much more labile kind of crosslink than... Um, so that was this model here, was it? Yeah. Look, this is... Um, we're still sort of trying to understand the model. What the mo I mean, this is, I borrowed this, adapted this, this model from a, a paper that I think was, it was published earlier this year where they, they demonstrate that the RNA was able to, to form gel, so, you know, form these types of structures. So, so I was, you know, and this hasn't been described for an RNA DNA network or complex, so I was just imagining what, what but, but the thing about RNA, you know, you get the short coding, non-coding RNA, you get things like trinucleotide repeat expansions and all the rest of it that can actually perform, they, they, they can uh, provide sticky sites for, you know, to, to, to generate these uh, more developed networks. So once we uh, have sequenced the RNA, we'll have a better idea perhaps of, of how the RNA is supporting this function. Um, I, have I have just yeah, this one more question. To the last slide before saying that no. Uh, no, it's not this. Uh, where you said this, uh, gel, so will, um, gel formation was this pH 12. No, no. So what happens is that, in pH yeah, in terms of previously, in order to um, isolate or dissolve or treat these biofilms, one of the common ways of doing that is to raise the pH, and that dissolves the biofilms. Um, and that's always been used as the starting point for trying to reconstitute or, or isolate the biofilm constituents. Um, and that works here. But, but actually what we demonstrated because was that... The pH 12, the extracellular matrix, as a in vivo, yeah, yeah. is completely dead. Exactly. So that, that's what I'm saying. Is exactly. So it forms at pH 7, but if we want to dissolve it, then we have to increase the pH up to 12. And so one of the reasons that it dissolves it at pH 12 particularly for pseudomonas biofilms, is that we're transesterifying during, due to the, 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 the um, RNA, this um, deoxygenated, sorry, oxygenated two prime proton. So that's why it's very soluble at pH 12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I suppose it's just denaturation at pH 12.